Well, praise God for another day and opportunity and privilege to bring you the living word of God. I want to take tonight, too, and invite you to a very special broadcast tonight, something that we haven't done before. And more than ever, I encourage the uh, viewing and listening audience to tune in to what's going to be shared tonight. We're going to have a guest speaker, a friend of mine from heaven, uh, that I'm going to allow to speak some. I'm going to give an introduction. We're going to cover a couple scriptures, and then we're going to do something different. I'm going to be so bold as to say this, is that uh, turn on, don't turn off, don't tune out. Trust me, you're going to want to hear this, and not just hear it for your own spiritual enrichment and edification, but also to share with people, all your friends, all family, anybody walking around in a physical body, bless God, is going to want to hear about this. I'll pray and we'll get right into it. You know what I'm talking about. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you once again for the privilege and opportunity to come before these, your precious sheep, not only here but worldwide. Less of me, more of you. In fact, none of me and all of you. Holy Spirit, have your way in the service. No weapon formed against it shall prosper. Any tongue that shall rise against it in judgment will fall because it's the birthright and the heritage of the servant of the Lord. Touch my heart. Speak through my mouth. Let the oracles of God flow freely. And let the word of God, too, that's going to come forth later via audio, speak into the lives of people. And we rejoice in the fact that my buddy Matt Gover made it to heaven. But uh, he's there tonight, and I know that uh, he'll be rejoicing too, and your word endures forever. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We shared last week, Lord, about offense. Uh, we're still going to touch on that some too, but what it'll do in a person's life, uh, uh, how the devil comes in and just hurts people and destroys their lives, and a lot of that happens through anger and offense. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we break the power of that tonight over lives throughout the world. If you agree with me and you think that should be done, say amen. 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 Praise God. Open your Bibles to Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Excuse me, Matthew 22. Matthew 22, I'm only going to cover a couple scriptures, then we're going going to get right into what we're going to do. It's going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on offense tonight because the speaking that I'm going to share um, is going to... uh, it's going to speak for itself, and uh, so I'm excited about doing that. We'll read a couple of scriptures. I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to, to where go ahead and kind of wet your palate, if you will, and also let you know um, that this man, I was privileged to know him, how I come to know him, how I got to minister with him, the impact and effect that he had on the world. And But when you hear his testimony, which you're going to hear tonight, and you hear what God will do, in the life of a person that's the total downtrodden, the beat up of the world, uh, what what the natural world would consider completely impossible. Uh, uh, Again, the speaking will validate that. And uh, I was just privileged, as God has done with me, with so many powerful men and women of God, it's been a selection uh, to me. And uh, this man was one of them, but the Spirit of God put this on my heart. Actually, last week I wanted to do it. Uh, and he had me uh, uh, teach on offense last uh, last week. You know, Jesus said in Luke 17, 1, you know, that it's impossible that offenses won't come. We covered a lot of powerful scriptures. We're not going to go over all that tonight. No, I want to encourage you to go back and look at the broadcast, bless God. And we're pleased about that because within the first, I don't know, 12 hours of that broadcast, we had almost 30, 40 people looking at it. So I'm really excited about that, not because of me, But somebody out there is interested in paying attention, and we're even getting some more subscribers. Oh, yeah, so I don't forget it while I'm at it, too. Uh, Hit subscribe, and then hit the like button. Amen? And uh, share it with friends. Let's spread the the gospel. Can you say amen? All right, praise God. (laughs) Matthew 22, we'll focus in on verse 37. And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And notice the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Now this is important why I'm going here. As thyself. 
I call it a proper love of self. Offense does this too in the lives of so many people, and I've lived it, so I'm qualified to talk about it. What happens is when a person, when life throws things at them, which it will with all of us, because Jesus says so in Luke 17:1. Luke what can happen is, depending on the situation, uh, offense and things that we're around and, and things that happen to us in our life, we, we, we can find ourselves in a place to where the fruit of offense then will, will uh, bear anger. The fruit of offense, there's other fruits of it, but a major fruit is anger. Now, where do we go with that? Anger will do this. It will make a person to where they're angry at themselves because one, they're gonna take, if they're offended, they're gonna be in the flesh, and if they're in the flesh, they're gonna begin sinning, period. In some form, they're gonna do it. And then what will happen is they'll have a difficult time not only forgiving others, but forgiving themselves, and that's why we're touching on this tonight. Amen? Amen. It'll make more sense to you in a minute. And Jesus goes on to say this about it, so how powerful it is, and Adam and is about this commandment. It says, love thy neighbor, of course, as thyself. On these two commandments hang all of the law, or the Old Testament, and everything that he put in the heart and the mouth of his prophets. Turn with me, if you will, to Mark's gospel. We'll validate that some more from Mark chapter 12. Mark's gospel, the 12th chapter. Again, on the broadcast, hang on, fasten your seatbelt, because then we'll get beyond these couple scriptures, and then we're going to take and take off, and then uh, we'll let I'm going to let Brother Max speak from heaven tonight. Amen? Amen. That's right. All right, let's focus in on verse Mark chapter 12. And let's focus in on verses uh, 29. Let's see here. just quote it. Another rendering, Jesus said on these two commandments, saying all the law and the prophet, he said there's no commandments that are greater uh, than these. Bear with me here a minute. I'm not better than this. What am I doing? I'm getting ahead of myself. Alright, Mark chapter 12. It is verse 29. And Jesus answered and said the first of all the commandments is hear O Israel. He says the Lord our God is one, one God. Or one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like unto it, namely, this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor, here it is again, as thyself. There is no other commandments greater than these. Praise God. Let me tell you a little bit about Mac Gober. How I met him. I met Mac at the Eagle Mountain Motorcycle Rally. Many of you know that I retired from the motorcycle business. I was in and around motorcycles for many years. And Kenneth Copeland uh, started having a rally. In fact, I went to the first one. I went to really most all of them that he had. It was also my first opportunity and privilege to meet Kenneth. And as a matter of fact, you can have lunch with him, bless God. Not that matters, but I got blessed. That's it. Isn't that the goodness of God? So, at any rate, when the, the evening meeting started, and I'd never heard this man before. And of course, you know, he had his normal speaker here, so that was there, and Jesse Planis and all like this. And it was a night meeting, and it was wonderful, and you had a ton of bikers, but you had people from all over the country, and it was an outdoor meeting. It was really cool. Then all of a sudden, he, invite, he called up this man named Mac Gover, who I'd never heard of before. And as Mac began to talk and share his story, uh, I, just, I just melted, as did so many people there. Okay? After the meeting, it wasn't that night, because this thing went on, it was like a three-day rally. The next day, uh, I got to 
talk to Mac and bond with him a little bit because I got ID with a lot of things that he had been through. Also, me being a soldier before, when you hear some things, you're gonna that's gonna make sense too. Uh, there was a lot of things we had in common. There's a lot of things uh, you could say we didn't, and the fact that Matt, I, you know, we've all been through some things. I've had my share. That's why I identify with him so much. However, Mac went through a lot more than I did. But uh, uh, wow, just wait till you hear what God, what God did in this man's life. And so uh, it touched my heart. And then uh, later, what happened is I was privileged to do this. I called on Mac. And I had him come to Jacksonville. And he came, and he came for a couple days, and I got to minister alongside of him as well. And because the altar calls were great. Uh, and when I say that, I'm not talking about just lost people. And again, this message I'd said a long time ago, most of my teaching is uh, as much or more for the believer as is the non believer. Okay? Uh, the New Testament, I said, is primarily written for the believer. It'll minister to a lost person, but it's written for the believer. You say, man, yeah. it's written for God's church, mm -hmm. his people, and that's who we are. So at any rate, I got to know him that way. The reason I'm sharing it, so you'll kind of have a little background before I get this started. And uh, uh, got to pray with him. It was super powerful. Uh, many rededications, people giving their lives to the Lord people from all different walks of life, backgrounds, ministries, everything was extremely powerful. And so uh, uh, that happened too, uh, and then later on too, I was able to co-labor him, with him in some other venues as well. And uh, he was just, uh, but when you hear this, I mean, he was one tough cookie, but um, God went in his life and made him one of the most tender men uh, on the other side of this experience and one of the most effective ministers in the world. He also formed a thing, he'll talk about it a little but not much. Uh, uh, it was called Canaan Land and he's from Alabama anyway. And what he did, he went out there along with a lot of these bikers uh, and they built cabins. And what they did, they took and allowed uh, these bikers that their lives basically had been ruined, outlaw type bikers uh, gangsters, if you will, but not just that, drug addicts, prostitutes, it didn't matter. Uh, uh, people that came from the prod, just, you know, the homeless, the, the lowliest of the low, okay? The, the world, the, the devil had just had a field day with them, beat their life down, and was destroying their life. And what they did, what the vision that God gave him was to have this as a refuge place a place of healing, and he would let them come for one year. There was no cost involved at all, and all they did was love them with the love of God. They never Bible beat them, uh, but they would let them sit under the word, hear the word, gave them Bibles, fed them, loved on them, let them recover there. Most of them had to have recovery. They were addicts. They had problems. You know, they had a lot of problems, but uh, they give them a year. And uh, many of them, of course, recovered before that year, but they would stay, and then they, they would be groomed in ministry, and then they would go out and do it themselves. Well, what started there as a starter seed, he ended up being able to do that in multiple places, even outside of the country. And uh, uh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a marvelous thing with what God did with him. So I just wanted to give that background for the viewing audience. Please be attentive and listen and I'm going to sit here too, and then when Matt gets it done, we'll close the meeting. Can you say amen? amen. Are you ready to receive Brother Matt Gober from heaven? Glory to God. About five more minutes. I, I don't want to take up a lot of time, Matt, and I know you guys drove hard getting here and everything, but i tell you what, I've learned something. I've got a beautiful wife today and three beautiful children, and I love them with all my heart, and I ran... I ran from God, and I didn't want nothing to do with God. I, I had a lot of bitterness in me. My mom and dad fought a lot when I was growing up, and I asked my dad one time, I, I'd ask him, have you ever been to church? And he said, yeah, boy, I went one time. And he said, I sat there on the front row, and he said, I had my shirt unbuttoned all the way down to my belt. He said, I was leaning at the girls in the choir. Some of those good folks asked me to leave. And I said, uh, you left? He said, yeah, they asked me to leave the church, son. And he said, but I went back. And I said, you did, Daddy? 
He said, yeah, I went back that next night and I burned that church down to the ground. He said, I took a gallon of gasoline and I set it on fire. So I didn't have a lot of real church growing up, you understand, when I was growing up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, me and Sunday stood a little real tight, you know, that's uh, not one of those things I had going for me. But uh, my dad taught me how to eat double edged razor blades and shoot a pistol back when I was a little guy. And uh, I was always getting in fights and, and uh, he just showed me how to fight. He was an old steel worker, he traveled all over the country. I loved my dad and, and uh, you know, but he was gone a lot. And I'd run at home at night time trying to catch my daddy, but my daddy would just drive by the old house all slipped over in his car, drunk, and he'd go on about his business, and he'd be gone for weeks at a time, and I'd go in just fine as a little fella, and I'd say, Mama, why won't Daddy come home? And I couldn't understand it, why my Daddy wouldn't love me and come home and play with me. I was the only child, and I didn't have any other brothers or sisters, and it just broke my heart that I didn't have that. And as I grew up, they began to fuss and fight, and just that hatred in that home begins to tear up a little child's heart. This world can be falling apart, but if mom and dad love each other, I guarantee it brings security to that child. But this world can be doing great. Listen to me now. I, they, they said I only got a few minutes here. Don't clap no more. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, this world can be doing great. But if mom and dad got pride in their hearts and they're trusting and cussing each other and, and they're throwing things and, and that home is so up. You're going to tear up your little children one day, and you won't know it until they're a teenager, and they're walking out the door when you're saying, well, what's wrong? Well, you didn't live the Christian life in front of them. You might have took them to Sunday school. You might have took them to church. But you didn't live the Christian life in front of them at home where it counted. And let me tell you that that's why we got to love each other all the time, not just on Sunday morning, yeah. and shake hands and smile. you got to be real with it every day in your life, whoever you're talking to, especially in front of your children. And so I didn't have that when I was growing up. And... Uh, I, I just, I know my time has run out, but I, let me just say this. My life was messed up, guys, and I didn't start out. Satan never shows you the end of sin. He shows you the bright lights, and he shows you the fun. I didn't just walk out there on the street one day and come out of Vietnam and say, now what am I going to do with my life? My, some of my buddies are bankers, and some of them are going to college. Some of them are doctors, some of them are lawyers. I guess I'll be a motorcycle man good occupation, a lot of money. Now, I mean, you don't go out there and, and just go out and decide you're going to be a motorcycle gangster. Satan never shows you the end of sin. And my life was messed up, and you, you meet one guy, and you start hanging out at the right kind of bars, and you're getting into fights, and I was a karate instructor, and I was mad at my country. My country turned their back on me. Well, one thing for sure, Offense. back at that time, uh, Don, a lot of the motorcycle games, out, one thing they stood up for, they stood up for God and country. They said that we're proud of American fighting men, and Thank many you. of your outlaw bikers today are Vietnam vets. That's too loud. Turn it down. But when I came back to my it's country and turned their back on me, it's like these guys kind of stood right there. I had some kind of camaraderie there, and we was hanging out, and I, I began to live that lifestyle. My life didn't end up for the next year, so up until I was 30 years of age, my life was in torment. I was constantly being chased with the police. I was arrested and put in jail many times, and the cops was after me from state to state. All points bulletin for cities would turn out. Every cop in the entire city, when they heard that it was me, would come to try to arrest me. They'd find me and they'd beat me down, 12, 13 police cars at the same time, and they'd put me in straight jackets, and they'd beat me down so I couldn't breathe. They'd put me in straight jackets and take me off to jail. And first they'd drop by the hospital, shoot my back full of needles just to get me to calm down enough so they could arrest me and take me in. I was married three times. And I left my first wife, first wife in a pool of blood. And uh, someone found her in this trailer later on and got her to the hospital she lived. And I thank God for that. I didn't care about God. I didn't care about you as an individual. My heart began to get cold and indifferent. And I began to rip pages out of the Bible and smoked dope in the pages of the Bible because I didn't fear God and I didn't fear man. I figured if I live through Vietnam, poor thing, you're going to jump up my face and threaten to shoot me? Oh, big deal. I mean, I faced that every day for a year, and you're going to be trying to be really bad. And so this pride and this ego comes on you. There's an enormous ego, an enormous spirit gets on you when you start riding all of this. 
I mean, if you've never from that background, just tell me, it's major league pride like you've never seen. And you begin to think you're somebody that you're not. You walk different, talk different, and, and a spirit comes over you. And I realized I was going to die that way. I was responsible for killing nine babies because I didn't want to be responsible for the whores and the prostitutes. I figured the best thing to do is just get rid of it and go on with my life. I didn't care about life in general. And uh, all of a sudden, I was being chased from one state to the other, and I was run out of one state for attempted murder and heavy drug sales, and they were catching me for all the heavy drug sales and the stuff that we were moving back and forth through the states. And I got on the old hard and I headed back to California. And I was going back out there to get with some brothers, and I was going to die. And I had lost my mind. But it's amazing. Satan never showed you the end of sin. He just showed you the bright lights in the front, but he didn't show you when it's all coming down. And I began to run, and I began to have paranoia like you wouldn't believe, and fear would grip my heart. And I just knew somebody was going to nail me. I, I, you, you don't trust anybody anymore. And all of a sudden, you're looking constantly indoors. And every time the door would, would beat, you, you think maybe they're coming to take you away. I ended up losing my mind. And uh, drugs had completely eaten me alive. And, and my brothers would take me out, and they'd put me in, in this old barn. Old Mexican had this old barn, and they'd lock me in this barn. And they would lock it down and throw food up under the table. They wouldn't even let me out for weeks at a time because I'd go completely crazy. And I'd lose my mind, and I'd get myself in trouble or somebody else in trouble. And, and so I'd, I'd go around beating my head into the walls, and the blood would just begin to, to squirt because I wanted to die because I was so sick of myself and so sick of all the things I'd done. And I wondered, how in the world did I end up there? Because I sure didn't just walk out on the street one day and just decide to do it. But I'm telling you, the devil's got such a way of leading you away into a path of his. Now, you, you might not have been uh, an old outlaw biker or anything like that, or maybe rode back there in them days, but you could have been just as bad if you would have been rejecting Jesus Christ, just like I was. All I was was rejecting Jesus Christ. I didn't want to hear about this God stuff. And then I got out there, and then I was standing downtown to get my money at a Western Union. And so money was being sent to me, and I was waiting there in line, and it was a long line that day. And I remember sitting there waiting there, and there was a long line going out there. And I looked at all those people that day, and I had my dark sunglasses on trying to be cool, you know, and trying to be bad. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, you know, of course, you don't ever go anywhere without your gun. And, uh, and, and I'm sitting there trying to be somebody I ain't. And this little guy is walking around passing these funny little, little pieces of paper to everybody. And they look at it and they throw it down. They look at it and they throw it down. Those little leaflets were everywhere. And, and he finally got up in the line and he got to me. And I didn't think he had the guts to hand me one. And a little bitty short guy, and I'm sitting there passing gas and barking and growling at him. And, and you know, I'm just trying to freak the guy out, which we do lovingly, you know. And uh, people were standing up going, oh, God, hey, you know, really. And uh, so I'm, I'm standing there, and this little guy, he holds out this piece of paper. But he never said a word to me. He just handed it to me. So I thought, I thought, just get the guy out of my face. I snatched it out of his hands. I snatched it out of any kind of growl. He walked out of the door, and I looked at this thing, and I hold it down here, and it said, just as I am. I thought, so what? I know who I am. I threw it down. The only thing is, it stuck to my thumb. <laughs> it literally stuck to my thumb. I mean, I, I get it over here, and I get it on my finger, and I get there. What is this thing, you know? <laughs> Well, when you don't take a bath every month, things kind of stick to you. So I start reading this little piece of paper, and you know what it said? Thank you. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't know. It said there's such a crazy idea that most people will never make it to heaven because they think they got to get rid of all their bad habits first, and they got to go to church or get good in some way before God will have anything to do with you. And he said, that's a lie. It said, but God commended his love towards you while you were yet a sinner. Christ died for you. Now, listen to this just for a moment. It said, while you were yet a sinner, yes. Christ died for you. Yes. But God commended his love towards you when you was a sinner. In the middle, in the darkest hour of your life, Jesus Christ got on that cross and died for you, regardless of what your hell might have been, regardless of yes. what your background might have been, regardless of what your sin might have been, regardless of what your perversion might have been, regardless of what deep hole you were dug into. He died on that cross for you when you didn't care a thing about him. He had you in his heart and mine. That's why he got on that cross. He died to free you from sin that would destroy your life. 
And it said under that, it says, be honest with yourself. And it's like that word jumped up off the page. I hadn't thought about being honest. I've told so many lies, I believe my own lies. I haven't been honest with myself in years. You never tell the cops the truth. You know, you go by the cop shop and you make fun of them, you know. You, just, you don't never be real with yourself. And all of a sudden it says being honest with myself. Yes. And it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It says, if you be honest with yourself and confess that you're a sinner, nothing but a sinner, bring it to Jesus, nothing but your misery, your pain, and your guilt. It says, Jesus will forgive you and save you and deliver you so totally without you having to do anything. It's not something you can do. You can't save yourself. He died to save you. All you've got to do is be honest with yourself and accept it. Well, man, I tell you what, that little piece of paper like it blew me away. I stuck it in my pocket and forgot about it. I thought it might be a good rolling paper. So several weeks later, a couple of weeks later, I walk into this apartment. It's a drug addict's apartment. I was going in there to pick up some stuff. As soon as I opened the door, there was a pamphlet laying down there right at the door. And I picked it up and I, I started looking at it and it was about God again. I thought, what's all this stuff about God all of a sudden? God, 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 every time God. And I'm looking at this thing, I'm sitting down reading it, and it starts talking about Jesus Christ coming back again, but it's only coming for those that are saved, those that have been truly born again, those that have made a decision to give their life to Jesus Christ. Well, I knew that I had it. And with my life in fast mind, I got to thinking about that. And for the first time in my life, I got to thinking, what if God's real? If God's real, I'm in a heap of trouble. <laughs> If God ain't real, ain't no big deal. We'll die and go back and be like a dog. But if God's real, I'm in serious trouble. And then all of a sudden, I begin to think about that. Well, this guy staggers out of the back room, this big old guy, and, he, and he's kind of holding himself up against the door. And while he's holding himself up against the door, I'm looking at him and rubbing his old eyes. And he said, what's going down, Big Mac? And I said, not much, man. I said, where did you get this religious thing? And he said, oh, that. And he looked at it and he said, this afternoon, great big old fat nigger woman was passing out. He said, I just punched her in the mouth and ran her off. He said, that just fell on the floor. I said, oh, I want you to know that I'm thankful to this day for that dear old saintly black lady that had enough guts to come out of her four little church walls and get out and knock on doors and say, I want to give you something for the Lord. Hallelujah. I never met that precious white lady. I never saw her, never laid eyes on her. But all of a sudden, I couldn't stop thinking about her. Everywhere I went, I started looking. I thought, like, dear God, what kind of love would be in that precious white lady that would go out and knock on places like that and give things out about her Lord? I just couldn't stop thinking about her. Two weeks later, I walked into this apartment. I went through El Cajon over to Lemon Grove, and uh, then I went on into a place, and I went upstairs. And I was by myself that night, and I got upstairs, and when I walked into that place for the first time in my life, I looked up and I saw in the corner of that room, it was about two o'clock in the morning, I looked up and I saw Jesus Christ hanging on the cross for Magdalene. This time I realized I, it wasn't just for the world, I realized he died for me. And I started crying when I saw him. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, Mac, I love you. And I started crying even harder and I said, but you could love somebody like me. I could see loving good people like you, people that work hard and are honest, and at least you're doing an honest job and you're out there taking home money and paying the bills and doing stuff like that. I couldn't see him loving somebody like me that had become the filth of this world. I wasn't worth shooting. I wasn't walking, I wasn't worth walking across the street spitting on them. Nobody cared nothing about me. A lot of my own people would begin to leave because they knew that I'd get them in trouble or get myself in trouble. I was dying and I knew I was dying inside. I knew I wasn't gonna live much longer. You ever been to that point where you just kind of sick and tired of being sick and tired? Yeah. and didn't know what to do, where to go, or who to turn to. And all of a sudden, out of all this thing, the man that I've been ripping pages out about, I used to get up in bars at our, at our places that, that we'd go to, and I'd play like I was Jesus Christ. And I'd, I'd get people to come take the nails out of my hand, you know. And then I'd fall off the bar with my head down on the floor. I said, you forgot the feet, you forgot the feet, you know. And just doing anything to laugh and make fun of Jesus Christ and ripping pages out of the Bible. And now how could he stay on that cross and tell me he loved me? It was blowing my mind. My mind couldn't understand. I began to cry. And I said, you couldn't love me. And I began to try to name the things that I had done to show him he couldn't love me. And I'd say, but remember the rape when I raped? And, and right in the middle of my sentence, he'd cut me off. And with that precious voice, he'd say, look, Mac, I love you. 
And I said, you couldn't love somebody like me. And I named something else. He said, but Mac, I love you. It cut me off right in the middle and said, Mac, I love you. I began to cry like I'd never cried before. I got down on my knees like that some little child. And I said, God, please don't let this be some mind game or spooky book. I, I, I can't stand it. No more pain. I said, God, is this really you? And it's like God was stamped on the wall when I saw that. And the Lord spoke to me and said, yes, Mac, I love you. And I began to beg him. And I said, God, I know that you could come back. After reading that paper, I realized that Jesus could come back at any moment. And I began to cry. And I said, Jesus, if you're fixed to come back, please let there be room for one more. Would you please let it be room for me? And I began to cry and said, please don't let me die and go to hell, God. Yeah. And, every, and for the first time in my life, I knew that hell was real and it wasn't a joke. And that all those Bible preachers and TV preachers were telling the truth that I had mocked and made fun of. And then all of a sudden, I knew that hell was real. I mean, there's something when you know that you know. And I knew that hell was real. And I was begging God not to let me die and go to hell. I asked him for two things. I said, God, if you'll let me live long enough, I want to want to find my mother. I just want to go back to her and say, Mom, I'm sorry for all the stuff I put you through. And I said, the second thing is, if you'll let me live long enough, God, I want to help young people know the truth about Jesus Christ so they won't have to go through the life that I went through. God helped me find my mother, and he helped me find that I got to her. And she was an alcoholic living with one, and he drank this up to death. And one night she fell on the open fire. She was so drunk and this motorcycle gang some of the brothers were coming by in another city and they saw her and they are burning and they broke in and took her off the fire and got her to the hospital and she lived. And I was able to find her four months later and I found my mother and I said, Mom, can you ever forgive me? I used to take my own mother through and drag her through the floor by the hair of her head, beating her in the face and she'd be screaming, Mac, don't beat me no more. And I don't know what possessed me. I knew it was the devil was a hold of me, but I didn't know how to get free. And for the night Jesus Christ came into my life and filled my heart with so much love. I didn't know that that kind of love existed on this earth. And then my life changed. And I wanted to spend the rest of my life helping anybody know the truth about Jesus Christ. He forgave me and I found my mama. And you know, she didn't get saved right away. But four years later, she gave her life to the Lord. Poured out all her whiskey bottle. Served God for 11 more years before she died a year and a half ago. And she died knowing Jesus Christ as a Savior. <laughs>
and you're in some kind of fact slipping condition, something's not right between you and God tonight, and you want to make it right before it's too late. Category number three. Maybe you're here tonight and you're a Christian. You're saved, but you've got some habits in your life that's destroying your life. And it's not a good testimony, it's not a good witness, and you know that it's not God. And the Holy Spirit's been dealing with you and dealing with you to get rid of it. So I want you to know, brother, you can. Because when Jesus died on that cross, the power has never left. Yes. The blood has never lost its power. Mm -hmm. And I've seen thousands come to me in the meetings and get delivered from everything, from crack cocaine to alcohol, cigarettes, you name it. People that, are, uh, that they've been bound by those habits, they said, I'm just tired of it, and I want to be free from it. You can be if you'll go back to that word and be honest. If you'll be honest with yourself and say, I really want to be free, and I'm not playing games, God. I want to be free. I want you to know that you can be tonight, but you've got to be honest with yourself. Number one, if you die tonight, you don't know that you'd go to heaven, but you'd like to know. Number two, you're in a backslidden condition, something's not right between you and God, but you want to be right. That's category number three. You've got some habits in your life that you know that you're tired of, and you're ready to lay it down and get rid of it forever. If you really want to be free, you can be tonight. When you walk out of this building, you can be free. Jesus is still setting people free. I've been bound by everything I guess I'm actually bound by. Could he set me free? I'm a free man because I trusted in him. Let's pray. If you don't mind, let's bow our heads right now. Nobody looking around, please, just for a moment. Just bow your, bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. The reason I do this, I'll tell you why. Because, number one, it's nobody's business what category you're in. That's right. Somebody's always going to know what kind of sin you've been in. Well, it ain't none of their business. This is between you and God Almighty. And the neatest thing about God is he just wants to forgive you tonight and let you know you've been forgiven. And so it's nobody's business what you've been out there. I've been in church before and somebody goes off and everybody won't know what they're down there for. Ain't none of their business. That's right. Well, I don't know what category you're in tonight. It's none of my business what category you're in. I'll tell you something else. It ain't nobody else's business what category you're in. Most important thing is that you be honest with yourself tonight and you say, Brother Mac, I am in one of those three categories and I want you to pray for me tonight. And I, I want you to pray right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you say, Brother Mac, I'm honest right now, and I'm honest with you, and I'm honest with God. And I am in one of those three fat categories, and I want you to pray for me. Lift your hand up right now. Just real big, just lift it up all over this building. God bless you, God bless you. Regardless of what category, just lift it up. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Yes. All right, now, you men that raise your hands right now, what I want you to do is look up and catch me now. Everybody else, don't keep, keep, just keep praying. If you raise your hand, regardless of what category you're in, and you're looking at me right now, I want you to just stand your feet right where you are. Just stand your feet. You man that raised your hand, you said, Brother Mac, I'm in one of those three categories, and I want something done about it tonight. My God, I love you guys. Because I remember the pain and the hurt when I was clawing my way through, and the power of God helping me day by day. Yeah. And sometimes I think I wasn't going to make it. But I want you to know His power and His love will never forsake you. And that's why this meeting is here tonight, because he loves you. I want to ask you to do me one more favor. I know this ain't no church service. This ain't no church. We're in the presence of God. And I want to, what is an altar? It's a place where a man or woman, boy or girl, can come and stand before God and say, God, forgive me. And mean it from their heart, and God forgives them the moment they ask you to. And it sets them free. This is an altar. We're just dedicated to the Lord. And all you men that are standing right now, Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Yeah. I don't think that one of you is ashamed of Jesus or you've never raised your hand and says, I want to get things right with God before it's too late. I'm going to ask you to do me one more favor. I want you to come quickly. Right where you men that are standing, let's stand right down here at this altar. Let's close in prayer tonight. All of you come quickly and just find your place at this altar. Is there water or something, brother? Just come. If, if you can't get all, all down here, just come as close as you can. There's still quite a bit of room. Try to come as close as you can if you can.
wait 15 seconds, like I do in a lot of my meetings. There was some of you that was fighting whether you should respond tonight or not. Listen to me. 15 seconds, and I'm going to close this meeting as far as this part goes. Some of you wanted to raise your hand. You said, I wonder, was it God or not? Listen, you know good well the devil ain't going to want you to respond to God. That's right. It's that simple. Man, if you've been wrestling with that thing in there, stop making excuses and rationalizing your sin away. Because when you stand before God, there won't be no shucking and jiving going on. That's right. And I listen, I've got some brothers out here that were one percenters or national clubs. Some of you came in, I, I don't know if you've been up. What kind of background you came from? I could tell that when you wrote a Harley Davidson. I just want you to know, man, God's got his hand on you. You're not here by accident tonight. The reason you came because God put a call on your heart, man. I'm just asking you to surrender to it. You don't have to do it. But I want you to know, don't you leave this place tonight without knowing that God loves you. I'm going to wait 15 seconds like I do in a lot of my meetings. Some of you men should have responded, but you, you didn't. You tell the devil to get off your back, and you tell pride to take a hike. Yes. Because if you don't want it, it'll destroy your life. And I'm telling you something, whether you understand it or not, the truth is Jesus is coming back one day, very soon. And many people will not have another chance to respond to God. Tonight, you've got that chance to respond to God. Tonight, you've got that chance to get right with God before it's too late. Regardless if you're in category number one, number two, or number three, there were some of you men, the Holy Spirit was tugging your heart. And you need to drop your pride and get up and come on and join these, these other men. I'm going to wait 15 seconds. And I want you to get up and just obey God. Come on, you can just stand up where you are. But you know in your heart the Holy Spirit was dealing with you. Just stand up and come on down. Because I'm telling you, there's some of you have been playing the wrong game. You've been playing out there in sin. And, and God knew about it. And it's time to let it go now and come and get it right before it's too late. Yes. You can sit there and hide and, and rationalize it away, but it won't work. It ain't going to happen for you. You've got to start off by being honest. And the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. First, I'm going to pray for you, man. Father God, I just thank you for every man that's here. I ask you to touch him and fill him with the Holy Spirit. Save him, forgive him, deliver him completely. And I'll give you the praise, and I'll give you the glory. God, I've seen you do it, and I know that you love these men, God, like you love me. Like you love Mike, you call him out of that coal mine. God, you saved a bunch of us. Your brother Jimmy has been serving God all these years. Do a miracle in some of these men. Some of these men standing down here tonight need a miracle. They're facing some problems and they need a miracle. And I'm asking you to do it tonight. Because they got honest with you, God. They came down here. They didn't have to. Nobody had a gun to their head. Nobody made them come down here. They came because they wanted to. Now they got honest with you, God. And I'm asking you to do a miracle for them. Now I want you men to pray with me this prayer. Pray loud enough that your own ears can hear you pray. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And this prayer is going to include all three categories. So if you've never been born again, things not right with you and God, and you're in a backslidden condition, or you've got some habits in your life, then whatever category you're in, when we get through praying this prayer, it's going to include all three categories. So I want all of you, I know about the Spirit of God, many of you saved, I know you love the Lord. But let's pray this prayer together, out loud. And let's pray it now. Say, Dear Jesus, come into my heart and save my soul. I don't want to die. And go to hell. Please forgive me. I repent. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth. Unashamedly. That you, O oh God, have raised your son Jesus Christ. You raised him from the dead. He's alive. Jesus, come in my heart right now. And save me. Please forgive me, Lord. Of the sins in my life. Now, right now, quietly, I don't want anybody to talk out loud, but I want you to take this opportunity to ask the Lord to forgive you. Now, I don't know what you came down here for. It's none of my business. It's nobody else's business. I don't care if it's murder. I don't care if it's adultery. I don't care if it's fornication. I don't care what it's for. I have no idea if it's unforgiveness, if it's bitterness, if it's jealousy, if it's anger. If it's something that's been struggling you and, and just choking the life out of you, whatever it is, I want you to ask God to forgive you and confess it right now, but do it quietly to the Lord. I mean, you don't have to air your laundry out before everybody, but take this opportunity at this altar 
This is a wonderful place right now. You're studying before God Almighty. This is an altar. This is a place where you can make things right. That's what this weekend's for, to take this opportunity and say, God, forgive me. It, it could be some kind of perversion, some kind of homosexual spirit, whatever, whatever thing has been choking the life out of you and destroying you. You just say, God, forgive me right now and forgive me of lying, forgive me of stealing. Uh, you, you name whatever it is, the Holy Spirit pointed at his fingers in your heart tonight when you were sitting there, the Holy Spirit put his finger right on your heart and said, get rid of it, stop it, get it out of your life. Right now, you just ask him, say, Father, forgive me, and I confess stealing is sin. I confess uh, adultery. I confess whatever it is the Holy Spirit tells you. I'm going to be quiet just for a moment, and I want you to take this time to ask God sincerely and honestly from your heart to forgive you whatever it is the Holy Spirit brought you down here for. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Like I say, brother, to forgive the story out of heaven. God is touching some of your hearts very deeply, not sensitive. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now listen to me right here. Category number three. If you've got some habits that you've been fighting with for a long time, listen to me. I want you to be honest with yourself right now. Regardless of what that habit is, apparently you didn't like it and you want to get rid of it. It wasn't a good testimony and it wasn't a good witness. And the Holy Spirit's been dealing with your heart. When I count to three, I want you to see yourself in your mind's eye standing by a river. But it's not any ordinary river. It's got the blood of Jesus in it. As Jesus died on that cross and the blood began to flow, it created a river for me and you. Now listen to me. When I count to three, I want you to see yourself in your mind's eye, take that old habit, and throw it right over into that river. It's just to help you visualize that the blood never lost its power. And the moment the blood flows, it separates you from all power of sin. There's no power that can keep you in bondage. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's heroin. I don't care if it's crack cocaine. I don't care if it's alcohol, cigarettes. It has no power over the blood of Jesus. Now, when I count to three, I want you to be like a little child. Don't try to figure out what you're going to do five minutes from now, ten minutes from now, uh, ten days from now. I, too, want you to just rest. Right now, rest in God. Amen. Trust in God and His awesome power. Don't even try to figure out what you're going to do. You just trust God right now and have childlike faith. Just like a little child. And when I count to three, see yourself in your mind's eye. Throw that old habit right over into the blood and then let it disappear. And I want you to see it disappear. One, two, three. In Jesus' name, you see that throw. Now they see it disappear under the blood. Now don't try to hold on to it. Just throw it away. Don't sit there and play with it. Throw it away. Now they see it under the blood. Now you're looking at nothing but the blood. Now then let's close in prayer and say this together. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For saving me. For saving me. For forgiving me. For and cleansing me. From all unrighteousness. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm on my way to heaven. Did you hear that devil? You hear that devil? You can't do anything about it. You can't do anything about it. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm free. I'm free. By the blood of the Lamb. By the blood of the Lamb. In Jesus' name only. In Jesus' name. I trust him only. I trust him only. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I got three things I'll share with you and I'll let you go. Number one, if you've never been born baptized, let me encourage you to be baptized. I know a lot of people say, well, the thief on the cross, he wasn't baptized. That's amen. Can you say amen? Yeah. amen. Glory to God. I mean, you enjoyed Mac's testimony. Amen. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Yeah. The Spirit of God wanted this out here. He particularly wanted this on the video because what we've been ministering on, really, a lot of these different broadcasts that we've been privileged to do every Wednesday night, it really... What you just heard is a culmination uh, of every bit of that. Um, you heard me say to myself about my own life, you know, uh, I would say to God, it wasn't a lack of faith. <laughs> it's called just making sure. You know, God, no matter what you got to do, don't let me die and go to hell. We live in a time now, I've ministered in other messages, that, you know, the Bible says if it was possible, even the elect, can be deceived, okay? Um, so it's a time now where we need to do a self-examination 
If there's a title tonight, it would be honest, okay, with yourself. Um, we all need to do it. We all need to do a self-examination for all of sin and all of falling short of the glory of God. Amen. So hopefully tonight it'll be a blessing to you. We'll close with Ephesians 4, and then I'm going to let you go home, bless God. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> Let's focus in on verse 26. And think about what Max said and all that too as I read this. Be, be ye angry and sin not. Notice that anger will make a person sin. And sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now it's interesting that the next, we hear this scripture a lot, but the next scripture, verse 27, says neither give place to the devil. Okay? Well, Anger is something that I've had to deal with throughout my life. A lot of ha things that happened to me in my life um, were similar to him. I loved my parents, but I was raised by parents that were basically what they call, uh, they were alcoholics, but they were uh, functioning alcoholics, if you will. They were married for 47 years. They did love each other, but they did, they fought a lot. Um, there was a n numerous times that they talked about getting a divorce and that made me very uneasy as the youngest child. My sisters left home early. And uh, like Mac, uh, it made me feel very uncomfortable and very insecure and isolated. I love my dad. I got to do a lot with him, unlike Mac, who never got to do anything with his father. But there's so much in this that I can identify with. And there's millions upon millions of other people I know that tonight, later, when they go, they view this. And they will, because the Spirit of God will see to it that they do. Only a baby by doing it will realize that no matter what you've done, God can turn your life around and give you beauty for ashes. That's right. And he'll turn your life around and he'll help you. Yes. The scripture says, do not give place to the devil. But notice it. It says, don't be angry and sin not. And don't let the, um, you know, the sun go down upon your wrath. I'll be transparent before you many times at, uh, in the evening. Sometimes I have to come to Terry. I might get aggravated about things because uh, of some behavioral and disposition problems. It's taken me years co-laboring with the Spirit of God to get out of my life. I've shared before, I want to be a better man. I want to be a better man of God. The bottom line, I'm not trying to say that my wife's perfect. There's nobody perfect. She can get angry too, but she is a better person than I am. And that's the way God does. He puts human people like that. Um, but we have learned uh, to not let the sun go down on our wrath. I had to go to my wife many times and said, look, and she used the phrase I love. She goes, it was so yesterday. She goes, it was so yesterday. Let's forget it. And we put it to bed. And then we go to bed. <laughs> Glory to God. But at any rate, I, I find it interesting in this portion of Scripture that one of the ways that we give place to the devil, it starts there. Look at what the devil did in Mac's life. He had a field day. He goes on to say, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the things which is good that need that he may have to give. See, God's a giver to him that's in need. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. I have to battle with that sometimes. I'll get mad and I'll miss it. Uh, I'm a transparent preacher. Amen? And I'm going to always be. Because I'm not going to stand before God's people and not be transparent and tell and stand here and act like that I'm holy, I'm perfect, and this, that, and the other. Holiness is something that's perfected that I'm working on in my life. The Bible says without it, no man will see the Lord. Unless God's a liar, I think we better pay attention to that. I've told you that God has changed the direction of the ministry. He's given me a lot because of this end time harvest period we're in. I used to never minister really along these lines. There's something he's been holding back. I said several months ago that he still has not given me full release to come and preach. But I'm going to get to do it. And it's something that's taken me a lifetime to come to realize. And uh, this is an area right now, we're in a place right now in this world 
people. We better be 150% focused on the Almighty and doing, notice their, their commandments are not suggestions. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the edifying. See, we're to edify and build people up, not tear them down. That it may minister grace unto the hearers. Okay? I had a, another brother of mine tell me one time, he said, Jimmy, he said, anytime you minister truth, you must minister grace with it. Yeah. This is why, yeah. the scripture right here. Other than that, you can damage people. That two-edged sword can cut people to pieces. They call it Bible beating them. 30, verse, verse 30, and grieve not. Notice what happens. It grieves the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Okay, let all bitterness, what did we talk about being offended last week? Bitterness is the fruit of being offended. And wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another. I'm challenged with this often with my wife. My wife goes out of the way. Okay, I'm not trying to exalt her. I'm just telling the truth. Because she wasn't doing it. I just didn't say that. The bottom line is she goes out of the way everywhere we go and eat, do. I can't go anywhere with her. Grocery store, you know, we're done. It's 10 minutes to get out of the parking lot. She thanks the, the you know, the, uh, the cashier. Uh, she's talking to them. She gets up. She's thanking the cart guy that's putting the carts up, praising God for him, talking about uh, all the way out to the car. We go, go to a restaurant, same thing's going on. And what that does, it sharpens me. It challenges me to be sweeter, to be kinder, to be like Jesus. What would he do? Okay, how would he act? I'll throw something out that wasn't necessary in the message. We are closing because what's neat, I'm going to close with verse 32 and we're on verse 30. Look here. The Spirit of God <clears throat> arrested my thinking about this. And I'd even talked to the pastor one time. I shared, and I shared this on a broadcast way back when everybody was getting all freaked out about the election cycle, all that was going on. And I got up one morning, I was shaving, I went and looked in the mirror, and the Spirit of God spoke to me as I looked in that mirror. And Paul said, It's like beholding ourselves in the mirror. He said, But straightway, uh, we forget what man or man we are. There's something about looking at yourself, being honest with yourself. Yes, I good. looked up in that mirror, and just as good, just as sure as Jesus was standing right there, looking back at me in that mirror, here's what the Spirit of God said. He said, "I do not love Donald Trump one bit more than I did Joe Biden." Mm -hmm. All right. Now give me something today. I understand a country has to have walls and borders, okay, to be a country. And we need to do that. And there's order in things. But the reality is, he's God. I'm just telling what the Spirit of God did with me. He shows up and he tells me this. And we, we don't have time to go to his word. Maybe we'll look at that later. You know, let all come to me that are heavily laden, right? Yes. I'll give them rest. Refuse not the little children. Suffer yes. the little children to come to me. I know that people are crossing our borders trying to come into a better life and they are coming in what they call illegal. But the Spirit of God told me today, He said I wouldn't turn none of them away. Now that's going to make a lot of people mad and I don't care. Because what I care about is the truth because it's the truth only that will make us free. They found a two-year-old little, two -year -old little boy abandoned this week, just the other night. Two years old, standing there. Thank God they found him. There was hundreds of other people packed in a bus, but he wasn't right there by. Completely alone. A two-year-old little child, scared to death. Don't you know it? Yes. Okay? That child didn't ask to be born into the world. He didn't ask for the world that he's living in right now. He didn't ask for the hell that he's going through right now. But I know somebody, and his name is Jesus Christ, that come to die for him, for not only his sins, if he lives long, with, with, and no matter how long he lives, but he come to, to love him, to love on him, to help him, to give him life, and to give it to him more abundantly. And as I always say, that's just extra. You do with that what you will. One day, one day what's going to happen on the other side of all this, I've said, I've said before, it's not about D.C. anyway. That's important, talking about Washington, D.C. It's about J.C. It's not about D.C. 
It's about JC. There ain't one person in this on God's green earth that can fix anything, and that's the Almighty. Can you say amen? amen. And we've got to come to the place as believers that we love everybody. Everybody. You heard Max's testimony, but you could love me. But you could love me, Jesus. Mm. But Jesus is good, but I love you back. Yeah. And he tried to say what he didn't know, but I love you back. He loved Mac Gober. I know he loves me without me telling him all my business. He loves everybody. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe on him would have to perish, but can have eternal life. He said, I come that they may have life. And it may have this life more abundantly. And admit it. It's time that we get on board, get on God's agenda, in the soldiers and the army of God, and we start looking through the eyes and the lens of God and start looking at people. That's why God spoke to me over a week ago. Remember, I told you, He said to me, Jimmy, quit looking at people as people. I want you to, everybody you see walking around, I don't care, tall, fat, skinny, white, green, blue, black. Look and see a soul. I want you to look at people and see a soul. That's a soul that I died for. I love them unconditional. I know they're doing weird, jacked up stuff. I don't. He cares, but it, he don't care. He don't want me to care. He said, "Judge not." In Matthew seven, lest you be judged. I find myself sometimes doing that. But yeah, they just. Uh, what well, they call them, the panhandlers, you know, they're doing this, you know, and he, he wants to, uh, three, if I give him three dollars or five dollars, he's going to go in there and buy a beer. Jesus said, give it to him anyway. We don't tend to go to those scriptures. Jesus said, turn, don't turn nobody away. If they ask you to go a mile, go twain. He said, if they ask you for money, give it to them. Pray for them, though. Pray for them, obviously. Disobey the Spirit of God. It's not me, it's him. Other than that, our traditions and our religion will make the Word of God of no effect. That's right. We'll be religious people. He's not religious. Jesus hated it. He came, that's why they got mad at him, and they were an instrument in taking him to the cross because he turned the world upside down. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. That so will be the close of our service. Till the next time we get together, bless God around God's word. If you don't know it by now, you hear me say it at the close of every broadcast. God loves you. We love you here at Cornerstone. And Jesus, give your life to him. He's Lord. Amen.